Welcome to Weekly Edition, a discussion of issues that impact our community and you. And so uh, our efforts of dropout prevention turn more of a, to an intervention focus. Victims are randomly selected in terrorist acts, typically. Mm -hmm. The airplanes go in there and get the details. Okay. They get in the heart of it, they get to the areas of the worst weather, and... Welcome to Weekly Edition, I'm Julie Williamson. I'm pleased to have as my very special guest an artist and writer whose work is internationally renowned. Eduardo Katz's work has been seen throughout the world and we're very thrilled to have him as our very special guest today. Thank you so much, Mr. Katz, for joining us. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Now, when I introduced you, I said artist and writer, but of course you're much more than that. And we'll get into that later, but first I wanna talk about your background how you grew up, how you got started, what kind of things interest you to get into this business that you're in now? My background is in literature, and I was very interested early on in all kinds of literary forms and became drawn into a mode of literary production that employs images. So in time, as this kind of writing that becomes visual, visual writing, I explored that, and that eventually led me to look into the world of images alone, mm -hmm. and that opened up a whole new path. Wow. So as a child, were you interested in liter literature, or is it something that happened when you were in high school or college? When did it all start? Well, um, my, I was raised by my grandparents, and they are, were basically reading all the time. So whether I went to the back room or to the living room, they were there sitting and reading. So it, it's natural that as a child in that environment, you start to read as well. Mm -hmm. And um, it was there with me uh, since early. And I've heard for years that it's important for families to have books around, to read to their kids and those kind of things. So obviously, this is what piqued your interest in the literary form, it sounds like. Yeah. And, you know, I was also uh, very um, early on interested not only in literature, but all kinds of forms of verbal expression from novels to poetry to comics to graphic novels, a whole array, and that also makes you aware of how you can express ideas, not just in one way, but in many different ways. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the term visual literature. What does that mean exactly? Uh, a good example in American literature is E. e. Cummings, a well-known poet who embraced the typewriter not just as a means of writing, but also as a means of creating visually. So he used the horizontals and the verticals that you can create with the typewriter and the white spaces and the uppercase and the lowercase as a means of conveying ideas, not just by the words themselves, but also the form, mm -hmm. the relationship of the letters and the words on the page, the white spaces, the rhythm that he creates by controlling uh, the, uh, the, the, the keys on the typewriter. All of these nonverbal elements convey meaning. So the text carries meaning through the words, but also through these visual elements. Okay, and so that's where you were going as, as a young person, it sounds like. Yeah, and, and this idea of the visual and the verbal combined brought me eventually to the realm of the visual alone. Mm -hmm. And this is when the whole field of art making opened up. Mm -hmm. Now, what were you like as a, as a young adult, as a college student? Was this something that was always on your mind or was it something that was just maybe like a hobby or an interest on the side? Were you majoring in art? Tell us about that. No, for me, um, I was very much committed to um, not knowing exactly what I would be doing in the future, but I was committed to continuing this exploration that I had started early on. Mm -hmm. That's what was driving me. And precisely because I was interested in something that neither a, a literary program or an art school could offer, I decided that I would benefit more, since I was going to go to college, I would benefit more from a program in which I could study linguistics, semiology, philosophy, in which I could use that knowledge that I would gain to continue my exploration, than be into a literary program that would lock me into a more traditional modality, or into an art school that would force me into a traditional modality. So I, I chose that path. And, and when I, in the introduction, I said artist and writer, but of course that doesn't really encompass all that you do and have done. Do you think that growing up in Brazil, a, a, I guess a culture that's seemingly, I guess, liberal, if you will, do you think that that had anything to do with how you create, how you became so creative? 
Well, every background definitely has some kind of influence. To deny that you are partially influenced by the environment and the city and the time you grew up in, it would make no sense. But also to reduce the totality of your being to that particular context would, would also be uh, meaningless. So it's always an interplay. There is an element of you know, growing up in that city, Rio de Janeiro, in that time, early 60s, in, in that particular household with that background, obviously that, that plays a role. Um, several languages were spoken in the house and I also studied uh, several languages early on. So there is a, Rio is very cosmopolitan, so I did grow up with a very cosmopolitan uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, one could say yes. But at the same time, I'm always searching for more. So obviously, that was not sufficient. That wasn't enough for no. you right, at that point. Now, you are considered to be a pioneer in what's called telecommunications art. Explain what that is. Um, we are accustomed to modes of art making in which a viewer goes into a museum or a gallery and encounters an object, a painting, a sculpture, a drawing, something inert. And that encounter takes place in the same space. There you are, and the object is before you. But at the same time that we've had Picasso, Dali, and many artists that uh, most viewers will be familiar with, um, at the same time, we had telegraphy, we had radio, we had television, and now internet, and other modes of communication that are not just painting and drawing, etc. Mm -hmm. So progressively, throughout the 20th century, artists started to work with these media, television, video, radio, and others, which were initially just means of communication. So they created artworks that were meant to be experienced from far away, not in the same space that the object is in, as in the gallery, but in your home, uh, in a mobile setting where you are far away. And these works can be broadcasts, but they can also be forms of interaction. For example, uh, an early mode of art making with telecommunications would be an artist or a group of artists in one country would send images to an artist or a group of artists in another country. And they would then manipulate these images, create new images with those ones, and send them back through the telephone, through video phones, through fax machines. And there would be this exchange and transformation of images. So the idea here is that the image would no longer be that final object that you would see in the gallery but it would be a means of establishing a communication between remote, distant groups. Mm -hmm. That's just a very sort of summarized uh, idea. And a lot of different artists throughout the 20th century uh, have, in different ways, pursued that idea. OK. So for the viewer or the person who's receiving this image, the, the person who did not have any involvement in creating the art, is it still interactive for them as well? Do they participate in this? Or is it just through the artist and then that viewer receives it and makes whatever they come up with from this image? Is that how it works? That's one example. Uh, and in many cases, telecommunications also wanted to uh, eliminate the notion of the viewer. Okay. Because everyone who would receive that image, so an ima one image would come and you'd have a copier. So if there are 20 people in that gallery or that setting, um, then you could make 20 copies, one for each, and everyone can make a variation of that and send to other people, and you could create this global form of exchange where the image is not the focus. The focus is the fact that, yes, we are far away, but we're together, we're working together, we're creating a mode of communication between us, and the image is just a conduit for that relationship. It's not the focus. Um, as you would be, say, in drawing, painting, Right, culture. or something that you're just sitting there exactly. watching or looking at. Right. Now, this all is so new to me. I've never heard of anything like this before. And I'm pretty sure the average viewer that's watching us right now probably hasn't either. Who is involved in the, I guess, the exchange of ideas and art, as, as you mentioned? Who, what group or how, how does this get started? How is it, how is it happening? Well, artists often respond, and more than respond, but they do respond to changes in society. So when telegraphy came about, um, the, the, the idea that you would write in such a succinct way, in very few words, affected the way writers thought their style. The idea that you could condense complex ideas to very few words 
and transmit them almost at the speed of light. This affected sensibility, just as the speed, for example, of current edits on television and the multiple elements on the screen, that affects sensibility. Mm -hmm. It is affected by the sensibility of the time and in turn molds the sensibility uh, of the time. So artists have always responded and intervened in these systems, from telegraphy to radio uh, to the video phone when it started to become available in the late 60s, early 70s, and the fax machines, particularly in the late 70s, early 80s, became widely available. So a lot of different groups around the world started to experiment with, um, with, with these instruments, and nothing prevents, just like today with the internet, nothing prevents someone from getting from, involved in exactly. that. Exactly. Getting involved. Now, another form of art that you have, um, I guess, also pioneered is called, uh, what is it, telegenetic or? Transgenic. Transgenic, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's also new to me. Mm -hmm. Transgenic art, which involves what? Explain that to us. Well, in fact, um, we could break down when you said telegenetic, it, it actually makes sense because some of my works do involve genetics and telecommunications both. So, oh, okay. So in the end, it does It, it does is apply. telegenetic in yeah, a way. Some works are, in fact. Uh, but I, I, what I have uh, effectively developed in the context of telecommunications is what I have called telepresence mm -hmm. art. Because as I have described before, telecommunications art was based on the idea of exchange and transformation of images, text, and sound. But telepresence art was different. Because think about it. Say that you are in Tampa and I am in Chicago and we're talking on the telephone. You have a sense that I am in Chicago and I have a sense that you are in Tampa through the telephone. You do not have a sense, if you are in Tampa, that you are in Chicago. True. And that's what telepresence gives you. Okay. Telepresence presents a robotic body in a remote space. So there would be a robot in Chicago. And through telecommunications, it could be a live microwave link, it could be through the telephone, you would find yourself in the body of that robot. You'd be looking through the eye of the telerobot, you'd be hearing what's happening in the environment, and you, through keys or some other kind of interface, you'd be controlling it and making decisions about where you want to go. So you gain a sense of being in a body that is not your own. Even though I'm in Tampa, I get the sense that I'm in... Chicago, Chicago through telepresence now, exactly so this exists or is this something that I started to create telepresence art in 1986 and that was a, a radical departure from the idea of telecommunications art as exchange of images wow wow we have to take a break we'll be right back stay with us Good for your mind. You'll find it all on Channel 18, the Education Channel. Every week, the Education Channel's classic film series presents the finest works in cinema from around the world. From compelling drama to political commentary to offbeat comedy. These films will engage your mind and enlighten your spirit. The Classic Film Series, Friday at 9, Sunday at 10, only on the Education Channel. 
And we're back with Eduardo Katz, a fascinating discussion about art, telecommunications, all those types of things. And you're really blowing my mind, I must say. So now, we were talking before the break about this telepresence, which is the robotic presence in one city when you're communicating with someone in mm -hmm. another city. Mm -hmm. When you say robot, you know, I get the image of R2-D2 or something like that. What is, what is it that you mean by robot? Well, that's when it gets really interesting because instead of trying to replicate what you know, try to create the, 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 the idea of a human being in another space, you can invent new bodies, new modes of sensorial experience, three eyes, one eye, two eyes, one in the back, one in the front. Uh, you can put the ear close to the ground or, or facing upwards. You can invent a, a body, a, a form of, of organism that is entirely your imagination. Mm -hmm. So I have, you know, since 1986, created many different robots, e tele-robots, each one for each particular artwork. One example is from 1996, um, a parrot, a tele-robotic parrot that was in a cage, sharing the, the cage with 30 small birds, and you, the viewer, the participant, could be in the body of the tele-robot, looking through its eye, moving its neck, and interacting with the you other birds. You could actually get the, the sense that you were in the, in the cage with the other small right, birds. Right. How does that feel? I mean... Well, it's very interesting <laughs> because if you were to actually walk in there, the birds would fly away from you. But as a bird, you could do it because they wouldn't walk no, away from they you. No, actually, they landed on the robot so much, they kind of perched on it and became quite friendly in a way because it, it doesn't you know it doesn't smell like another bird doesn't smell like a human being doesn't have um, that that quality that would make them want to fly away so you can put these robots in different settings that exactly. we as humans really don't have an opportunity to experience and you're touching on another dimension of telepresence art which is equally fascinating which is exactly the environment in which the telerobot is so you can invent the body you can invent how the participant is in the body. Is it through virtual reality glasses? Is, is it through joystick? Is it through keyboard? Is it through a combination of these things? Is it some interface that you invent as well? The environment is another very interesting element because you could create a setting like I did with this cage that was designed for the work, or you could put it in the wild, or you can create something that is completely with no resemblance whatsoever to anything that you know. The environment is an equally important aspect of the creation of telepresence art. Hmm. Wow, that is fascinating. I want to be a part of that bird thing. <laughs> <laughs> now let me ask you too about transgenic art, which we sort of touched on in the first uh -huh. segment, but that is genetic, it's an art form that also involves genetic engineering, and could you explain that to the viewers? Yes, um, as we talked about before, artists have always responded to social changes, cultural changes, technological changes of their time. And one major factor uh, shaping culture, shaping society today is the biotech uh, revolution, is the changes in, in biotechnology, bringing all kinds of ethical problems, but at the same time, bringing new tools, bringing new kinds of relationships, new problems, etc. And I have then developed what I have called um, transgenic art, which literally means that art in which transgenesis, the expression of genetic material from one species in another, is the medium of creation. But again, as we have talked about, this is not a metaphor. This is a literal embodiment of the idea, because mm -hmm. I always work that way. Okay, so very literally, because you have created a uh, bunny, GFP bunny, mm -hmm. um, called Alba, who is fluorescent green. Exactly. Now, that was created how? How was this bunny created? Well, it's important to, to stress that when you, when you say introducing genetic material from one species into another, it could paint the picture of a physical introduction of something into a living organism. That's not the case. Okay. The work is done at a very, very early age, a very early stage, that is in which you basically have a petri dish and an egg that is not fertilized. And when you have fertilization, then the DNA is introduced even before the two cells, male and female, fuse. So it's a very, very early stage. There is no embryo even okay. when that happens. Okay. And that's done microscopically and is a procedure that is analogous to in vitro fertilization, IVF, that um, is 
also very, very common. So that's basically it. You're using a microscope and you are using uh, genetic sequences that are known to be safe uh, to, to employ in this manner. And uh, after uh, you introduce the genetic material, then there is gestation and birth. And out comes a fluorescent green bunny. <laughs> because the sequence comes from a jellyfish that usually glows green. Okay, so that the, was the other species that you used to create the coloring of the bunny. Yeah, uh, coloring the sense of fluorescence. Yeah, you, you, you can only see it under blue light. You cannot see it under regular uh, So he white looks light. like our typical white bunny? Albino rabbit, exactly. Okay, and, but under... Blue light. He takes on a green fluorescent... Yeah, emits green light. But you must look also through a yellow filter because you have to block the blue light because as you might imagine, if you have a white surface, which would be the coat of the albino rabbit, and blue light, it's going to be blue. Mm -hmm. So you have to block the incident blue light to see the green. That is always the case. There is no other circumstance in which you can see the green fluorescence, which is not under blue light and blocking that with the yellow filter. Wow. So now for the creation of this bunny, it was created in 2000, correct? Correct. Is it still alive? Yes. It's still alive and doing fine. Yeah. And it's, is it male, female? Female. Female, mm -hmm. okay. Now with this creation, can this bunny have offspring or is it not fertile or how does that part of it work? Um, with transgenic uh, life forms, transgenic organisms, it's pretty much like with any other kind of organism in which you have a 50-50% chance of um, expression of that particular characteristic. Just like with our parents, there was a 50% chance that we would express, you know, father's nose, mother's ear, um, and you only know when, when there's a bird. <laughs> right, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> so the bunny can have other bunnies. Has the bunny had any? Offspring? No, no. no. And you do you no. do you plan to mate? Well, I would like to, yeah, but that's you know, that's not in the plans at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Now let me ask you a question though. When you create something like this, this is art, basic or I don't know, is it classified simply as art or is it it, it is much more than that, genetically. But what were some of the ethical issues surrounding this? I'm sure that, that when this um, bunny was made public, there were some people who probably thought that this wasn't such a good idea, that you were kind of messing with things that you shouldn't really be messing with, correct? Well, that is always the case when uh, new art forms are developed. There's always a, a resistance because we tend to get attached to what we know, to, to traditional forms. And earlier, when we talked about telecommunications, we talked about the relationships that are established between those involved, where it's not so much a matter of producing a physical artifact, but it's about creating a situation, a context, not so much content, but a context in which a new idea emerges. Mm -hmm. In telecommunications, the relationships through exchange of images. But here, the work is not so much, the artwork is not so much the rabbit herself. She is a part of it. But the idea was to think of a threefold project. One involved the, the imagining of a being and the concretization of that being. In other words, the legend of the chimera leaping into life, the imaginary being becoming real. Just that alone was a significant gesture in one element of the work. Mm -hmm. The other was uh, my desire and my expression of commitment from day one to bring Alba home and be personally responsible for her because that was an ethical aspect of the project that had to be there from the beginning. And the third element of the work was the debate that I was hoping to encourage with the project, which would then be much bigger than the presence in the home and, and be social in, mm -hmm. in, in its full expression. So I'm sure this was a, a worldwide dialogue yeah. about the bunny. What kind of responses did you get? The, re the responses vary widely from uh, support and understanding of the seriousness of the project to rejection and um, rejection manifested in, in also in a variety of forms. Mm -hmm. Now, with this project, were you, and I hate to keep harping on this, but this is so fascinating to me, 
when you went into it, when you started to do the, the genetic engineering for the bunny, did you know that this would create a green fluorescent bunny or were you kind of, you not sure what you were going to get? No, I knew exactly because okay. uh, otherwise it would be an experiment. Okay. And I don't do that. I don't, I don't create experiments that you don't know uh, the outcome. My, my work is really couched on a body of scientific knowledge that is established. Um, and this gene, this GFP gene that I work with, GFP stands for green fluorescent protein, um, is a standard uh, gene used in biology all around the world all the time. Mm -hmm. Because scientists use it for a very different purpose, as is the case. Uh, the military uses television or video for one purpose. Uh, news channels use it for a different purpose. Artists use the same tool for a different purpose. Okay, so good. it's always the case. Um, scientists use GFP to visualize genes inside an organism without having to eliminate that organism or to cut that organism open. They can see what's going on through the fluorescence, but usually they do it locally. They do it in the liver or they want to see it here, they want to see it there. That's not what I was interested in. And because of that, they call it a marker because it marks the gene that, that, that they're interested in. In other words, they take the fluorescence gene, they attach it to something that they're interested in. They're not interested in, in the fluorescence gene. In what it can show them, basically. Exactly. But I attach nothing else. I'm not interested in whatever else. I was interested only in that gene, in that gene alone. So okay. there was nothing else. And usually they, they express that fluorescence in a very small area. I was interested in ubiquitous expression, expression in the whole organism. I, I wanted to talk about the idea of, of a social marker, how we construct the idea of the different. Mm -hmm. Because under regular light, she looks like any other albino rabbit. It's only in, under this very special condition that she manifests that particular quality that she possesses. But isn't that true of everyone else? Right, exactly. In different lights. <laughs> exactly. So um, this is very, very fascinating. And we've only really scratched the surface of what you do and how, the work that you've been involved with. But we have to go right now. So thank you very much for joining me today. And this was very fascinating, very interesting. And I hope that um, you enjoy your time here in Tampa. Very much so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Be sure to join us right here for Weekly Edition next time.